Good morning. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to this gathering at Cross Point Church, where we come together to glorify God by cherishing the gospel, by caring for his people, and by reaching beyond ourselves and being on mission. If you're with us as a guest today, I want to say welcome. My name is Aaron Abbott. If we don't get a chance to uh, meet and talk today, I pray that you'd uh, or ask that you'd fill out a communication card in one of the chairs in front of you and put those in one of the offering boxes towards the back of the sanctuary. It's just a great way for us as elders to get to know you and say hi. There's a few announcements in the bulletin today. I just ask that you open that up and uh, look at those yourself. Take notice of those. Um, so we have a, a military family, the Ashers, I'd like to ask to come forward this morning. Come on over. So if you don't know, this is Chris and Sydney, and then their three kids. We've got Walter and Clifford and their new addition, Piper. So uh, as you all know, our church is in a unique place in our world. From time to time, young military men and women move here knowing that they'll only be here for a couple of months or a few short years. Our church has been blessed over the years with people and families who join our church here because while they're here with us, we feel like it's our duty to God to pour into them and encourage them. Yet we find that they build us up and encourage us towards holiness and worship. So, Chris, hear the words of the apostle. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction but you keep your head in all situations endure a hardship do the work of an evangelist discourage all the duties of your ministry second timothy 4 1 2 and 5 um, to all of us um but let me go back here i, I apologize where are you going next we're going to be PCSing back to Phoenix, so moving back there, and then, of course, we'll be down in Altus uh, starting December 6th. Very good. And when does all that take place? We'll be moving this week and then uh, be back in Phoenix for that short period before we head back out here to Altus. So. so Haley and I moved here when we had a baby that was nine days old. Um, you might call Haley. Uh, I don't always recommend a move with a baby, but <laughs> good luck. <clears throat> good luck. So uh, <laughs> It's going to be exciting, yeah. <laughs> so how can we pray for you? Uh, how can, can we pray for Mama? Yeah, continued grace and strength for us uh, growing in our marriage. I just got back from survival training, so that was, I think, a stressful <laughs> period for both of us. It was survival training for both of us, um, especially with everybody at home. Yeah. Um, so grace is our circumstances start to change over the next few years. Uh, to continue as a family. We've got, we've got two days to pack up, so you could pray for that. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, you'll be missed, and your kids will be missed. All right. To the congregation, to all of us, people of God, I pray that we send the ashes off as those God has called to himself for his mission and to his glory. We pray that whatever God continues to lead them, that they'll go and make disciples in all nations, Matthew 28, 19. We'll remember that, we'll remember and call on them to hold Christ in honor, that we'll support them with prayer, that Christ will sustain them with his mercy. <clears throat> in a fallen world, you joyfully follow Christ with hope and love and bring good news to, to as many as you can. Um, there's a, I want to read a few stanzas from the following hymn by Basil Manley. Soldiers of Christ in truth arrayed, 
A world of ruins needs your aid. A world by sin destroyed and dead. A world for which the Savior bled. To God, to the lost, proclaim good news for all in Jesus' name. Let light upon the darkness uh, break that sinners from their death may wake. We meet to part, but part to meet when earthly labors are complete to join in yet more blessed employ in an, an eternal world of joy. Now for all of us this morning, the reason we're here today is in response to God's power and goodness to us in Christ, our Redeemer, our forgiver of sin. With that in mind, let's spend a moment quickly focusing our hearts towards the reality that we are gathering for one thing, to worship our glorious Lord. Let's go to prayer in adoration. Dear Lord, we're reminded in Psalm 145.3 says, I adore you because you are great and greatly to be praised. And we're reminded in Romans 11.36, creation shows me your wonderful work, your power and your beauty in all things. Lord, we marvel in your majesty, your creation and your amazing might. Nothing fills our hearts with wonder like when we pray and adore you for who you are. O oh Lord, we lift up your name because you are worthy. Lord, I ask that you'd guide our worship, call people to you, and build us up in faith. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Lashers, thank you. Love you guys. Be praying for you. Okay, now let's all stand and be called to worship from God's word, which sets the tone and helps the posture, posture the heart towards God ways. Hebrews 28, 29, therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's sing this chorus together today.
sung about all we have is Christ and praise the Lord for that. He is all we need and he is the one who unites us today but oftentimes we forget who he is and so corporately we come to confess our sins together. So let's do that. Let's bow our heads and confess our sins. Lord we confess that we are a performance driven people. We often approach our faith like we do our work thinking that by working harder we will receive more from our labor and more from you. But your word says that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Our work does not save us. Your word also says that our good deeds are but filthy rags. 
Father, please forgive us for our misplaced trust in our own works. You have completed the work necessary for us through the perfect life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Lord, our works-based faith also reveals our pride and that we think that our lives are more precious than your kingdom. But your word shows us that your people delight in just being a, a part of your kingdom. Help us to work hard for your name and please realign our vision for our lives to your desires according to your word. And we thank you for your spirit you've given us, who enables us to be fruitful and reminds us of the work of Jesus for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, be assured from the scriptures, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's continue singing about the ability to rest in Jesus today.
as is our custom, we're going to look to the Psalms to guide our prayer as a congregation. So this morning we'll be in Psalm 44. Hear these words of the Psalm and then let them guide our prayers. Oh God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm, and the light of your face, for you delighted in them. You are my king, O God, ordained salvation for Jacob. Through you we push down our foes. Through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. But you have saved us from our foes and have put to shame those who hated us. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. But you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. You have made us turn back from the foe, and those who hate us have gotten, have gotten spoil. You have made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the peoples. All day long my disgrace is before me, and shame has covered my face at the sound of the taunter and the reviler, at the sight of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you, and we have not been false to your covenant. Our hearts, our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Yet you have broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake! Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up and come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. Our Heavenly Father, we are humbled to approach you in prayer this morning. We are so thankful to you for preserving your word for us, your word that tells us of who you are and what you have done for us. When we read of the salvation brought about by your right hand and mighty arm, we're reminded how you have delivered us from sin and condemnation for your name's sake, not ours. And just as the Israelites were helpless in their plight, so are we every day of our lives apart from you, Father. We boldly ask you to save us from our daily foes in the same way you saved us from our bondage to sin and death because of your grace alone. Our God, we are lax in our discipline of giving thanks to you, so we ask your Holy Spirit to stir our hearts to give thanks to your name forever. Father, because of our inward focus, we often feel forsaken by you, and it feels like you've handed us over to our tormentors and hidden your face from us. We are regularly beaten down by physical ailments, emotional distresses, and spiritual battles, Turn our eyes to you and your word, which promises that you will never leave us or forsake us. Open our eyes to see your purposes in the midst of trials and teach us to seek your face more than our comfort. Teach us to look continually to Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that we by his poverty might become rich. Lord, give us a longing for your riches over worldly riches. Help us to properly prioritize how we spend our time, our money, and our other resources for your glory and not for our own, for your name and not for our own. Father, we often deceive ourselves and think that we haven't forgotten you or that we haven't been false to your commands or that our hearts haven't turned back from you or that our steps haven't departed from your ways. 
we regard ourselves as sheep to be slaughtered. We're foolish to stack up our resume for your consideration. Pierce our hearts with the truth of your gospel, that when we were enemies far from you, Christ, the true Lamb of God, died the death we deserve and freely gave us the righteousness he deserves. Father, give us ears to hear your word and eyes to see your truth. Protect us from spiritual blindness that Satan attacks us with. Strengthen us to face what you have ordained for us and teach us how to view our neighbors as you do, created in your image and valuable. Father, sustain us in our weakness and in our strength, in our, seek, in our sickness and in our health, in our anxiety and in our joy. We pray with the psalmist, rise up, come to our help, redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. We pray these things for our good and your glory. Amen. As you stand, we'll continue to worship uh, through song. I did want to say a quick note that uh, you can all stand. Uh, we'll have a guest preacher this morning, but if you've been at our church for any length of time, he's not a stranger to us. Kevin Friesen uh, has been here at the church for, uh, a, for a long period. He's served in leadership roles. As Asher and the other elders have communicated, we've tried uh, and we're excited that there are other men that have shown a desire to proclaim the truth of the gospel and God's word uh, through sermon on Sunday mornings. And so he'll be uh, uh, bringing the sermon later, Kevin Friesen. So.
Our sermon this morning will come from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 18 through 19. Let us now hear from the word of the Lord. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, it is a joy to preach the word of the Lord this morning. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kevin Friesen, as Adam uh, said, and and, uh, just really looking forward to digging into God's word. So where were you on June 5, 1989? Some of you remember. Uh, I was in college. Um, but then again, there's a lot of you here that are, weren't even born yet, right? <laughs> so. Well, some of you may remember that day because on that day, a line of tanks rolled into Beijing's Tiananmen Square to crush pro-democracy demonstrations. Chinese officials had ordered soldiers and police to shoot and kill student protesters. Tensions were incredibly high, but as the tanks progressed along the main route, one solitary man stood out from the crowd. No one knew the identity of this one man who defiantly walked out into the middle of the street and moved directly in front of the army of tanks. In this act of defiance, Tank Man, as he was called, was filmed standing in front of the tanks, and even as they tried to move around, he continually blocked their path. This one unknown rebel was able to grind to a halt a column of massive tanks all by himself. It is a reminder of how one man with one action can have an epic effect. So today, I hope you will see in our text the effects of the one man Adam and the one man Jesus Christ. We will then look at the effect of the salvation we have received in Christ. With that introduction, would you join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. Father, we are are needy people. And God, what we need most is you. And so we pray that as we come to your holy word, that you would speak to us, that you would uh, change us by your word this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to just give you a little bit of an introduction to uh, the book of Romans, uh, a glorious book. Um, The Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote the book of Romans to the church in Rome, likely while he was in Corinth on his third missionary journey. This happened approximately in AD 58, and the letter to them served as both an introduction of himself as an apostle and also a way for him to clearly articulate the gospel that he had been preaching and teaching wherever he went. In fact, we find in the book of Romans that Paul actually used uh, the word gospel around 60 times. Uh, It just saturates the book, and it is certainly front and center in our passage today. Paul builds his case in chapters 1 through the first part of of chapter 3, where he shows how utterly sinful, lost, and condemned all men are, how all men are under the curse of death, In chapter 3, verse 21, though, we have a dramatic scene change as Paul shifts to showing how in spite of this terrible news, there is also good news. Life is available through faith in Jesus Christ. So this poses some interesting questions for us. How is it, for instance, that all people have this sin problem that is impossible to overcome? And furthermore, how is it that one man, Jesus Christ, can be the cause of so many being made right with God? Well, Paul, Paul has some answers. He builds on the foundation of the theme of salvation that he started in chapter 3 through chapter 5, where our passage today resides. One preacher says of chapter 5 that the apostle is concerned from this point onward to show us the absolute character, the fullness, and the finality of the salvation which comes to us as the result of justification by faith. 
So, as was read earlier, our text for today is Romans chapter 5, verses 18 to 19. If you don't have a Bible this morning, I would encourage you to grab a Bible uh, in the seats in front of you and get that out. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible this morning, that is totally fine. You can turn to page 942. So 942, New Testament, Romans chapter 5. For today's sermon, there are two main points that our text makes clear to us. And in your notes, you will see that I have titled them, The Effect of the One Man, Adam, and The Effect of the One Man, Jesus. There's also going to be some application for each one of those points as we move through it. So look at point number one in your outline, The Effect of the One Man, Adam. Romans 5, verse 18, notice that our text starts with the word, therefore. This word, therefore, helps us to see that something is coming. In fact, those two, these two verses are designed to summarize what Paul has been talking about previously in verses 12 through the end of the chapter. So 12 through 17, th- these two verses that we're talking about here are basically a summary of that section of the chapter. And we don't have time to go through it this morning But this section of Scripture is filled with terminology directing our minds to a glorious comparison or an analogy of Christ with Adam. And this comparison, it it shows up clearly in our text today. So look look with me at our text, and you can just look at those two verses, and the comparison shows up in the structure of these two verses. We see, for instance, two statements that use the word as and so. We see two statements of contrast within each verse, and then we also see two different men, Adam and Christ. And so we see here an analogy by contrast, an analogy by contrast in that the only thing that is actually similar is that one act of one man has an effect on many. Throughout Romans, and especially in chapter 5, you can see Paul showing very clearly how all people are related spiritually to Adam, but all believers are related spiritually to Jesus Christ. So in this first point in your notes, the effect of the one man, Adam, we will focus on the first half of both of these verses, okay? So we're going to look at the first half of 18, first half of 19, and then we will move on uh, in the second point to the last half of those two verses. So the first part of the contrast, look again at our verse at verse 18 in our text. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. This statement provides a very clear picture of what is known as original sin. The doctrine of original sin, as R.C. Sproul says, is the consequences for the human race of Adam's first sin. So one man, one trespass, or your translation may say one transgression or one offense, but all of the words mean the same thing, and that is sin. So keep your place marked uh, in Romans, and let's move to the, to the Old Testament. So the Old Testament, first, first book of the Bible, Genesis. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2, 16 to 17. Asher, of course, has been preaching through Genesis, and uh, he spent some time uh, preaching these, these passages back in the summer But I want to remind you this morning what the original sin looked like. So Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now flip the page to chapter 3, verses 6 through 7. Chapter 3, verses 6 through 7. The Lord... So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So notice here that God gave a command to the man of what he could and could not do. And the man and his wife Eve sinned by disobeying this commandment. There are are actually many consequences that, and Asher preached through a lot of these, many consequences to this sin in these verses, but I want to highlight one. So chapter 3, verse 19, I want to just highlight this for us. Chapter 3, verse 19 says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, 
for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So the consequence here is, to dust you shall return. What is this referring to? Well, it's referring to death. Death was the result of Adam's sin. And not only death for him, but, we, but as we shall see, his sin had tremendous effect on everyone else. So go back now to your, our text in Romans 5.18. Flip back, Romans 5.18. It says, One trespass led to condemnation for all men. So what Adam did in sinning led to certain results for his people, for all people. Adam is what many theologians call a federal head. That is a representative of his people. Because of the one man's trespass, all people are treated as sinners. So listen to what Paul says in verse 12 of chapter 5. He says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. Because of this one man's, uh, one sin of Adam, we are all under, what does it say? Condemnation. Or another way to say it is we are all under legal judgment, and that judgment is death. So sin enters the world through one man, Adam, and then death enters through sin. After that, it says death spreads to all men. So you see, God always keeps his promises. And in that garden, he promised Adam that he would surely die if he, if he disobeyed. And guess what? God kept his promise. Some of you in this congregation um, have lost loved ones this, this year. They've passed away, and it has caused heartbreak. It has caused sadness. What loss you have felt. We all know that, that death is inevitable, but it still cuts us to the core. There's no stopping it. There's no derailing it. There is no avoiding it. The truth is that we all bear in us the inheritance of Adam, and that inheritance is a sinful nature. We are born in sin, and therefore we all also have upon us the curse, the sentence of death. But look, but look with me now at, at verse 19 and continue peering closely at this first Adam. Observe and see how Paul actually goes further as he uses the word for. Verse 19, for, as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. This word for, if you can, if you can picture it, is like a, a large blinking neon sign. And this large blinking neon sign is saying, listen up. It's a word that is saying, I'm going to take you even further than we were in that previous verse. Before I talk about that, though, um, it is important to note that Paul is actually using a literary device in his writing in these verses. For instance, when Paul says the many here in the first part of 19, he means all. He uses this parallelism, as it is called, to help press forward the analogy between the one man Adam and the one man Christ Jesus. Uh, John MacArthur calls it a literary device for the sake of keeping his analogy pure. And it's, it's good to note that Paul has used this previous. So like in verse 15 of chapter 5, he says, for if many died through one man's trespass. Well, he uses the word many, but of course the many here means all, for we know that all have fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. So keep that literary device in mind as you read our passage, and we're going to see this later, but we always, always need to use the rest of Scripture to inform the truth of who the all are and who the many are. All right, so let's go back to the neon sign, the neon sign four. So we looked at verse 18, where, where because of Adam's one trespass, we were all treated as sinners by a judgment of death. So how can it go further than that, you may be asking, right? How can it go further than a judgment of death? But look at verse 19, it does go further, for it says, for by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. This word made is actually much stronger than what our English word suggests uh, some of you may have translations that use the word appointed. That's a helpful, that's a helpful word. Um, Wade and Grudem says that the word actually indicates completed past action. So when Adam sinned, God thought of all who would descend from Adam as sinners. It is as if we all have completed this past action of sinning. Notice that it doesn't say also that they were made sinful. No, 
they were made sinners. By using a noun and not an adjective, Paul makes it clear that mankind is regarded by God as sinners. Another way of saying it is that Adam's sin was imputed onto all of those who came after him. Imputation is a legal term uh, that can be pictured as a judge's declaration of innocence or guilt. If you listen closely in this passage, you can almost hear the sound of the gavel come down as Almighty God, our judge, declares us all guilty because of Adam. David says it this way in Psalm 51.5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He acknowledges that he was what? Brought forth in iniquity. That even before he was born, in fact, at the moment of conception, he had a sinful nature. So God counts us guilty because of Adam's sin. We are in Adam. We are in sin. But how were we made sinners? Well, let's look at our text again. The first part of verse 19 says, By the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. This word disobedience jumps off the page to us, does it not? And especially if you're a parent in, in the congregation this morning, that might, uh, that might make you think a little bit back to yesterday or maybe this morning when you're thinking about your kids and dealing with disobedience or obedience. Very difficult, right? I mean, teaching them to obey. Brenda and I, we remember it well with our three kids. And it's like, why is this such a battle? Why is this such a battle? Well, it's because they naturally go the way of disobedience. It is their nature, and it is our nature. As we saw in Genesis 3, there was one act of disobedience, So how many sins did it take for God to condemn the human race? One. One man, one sin of disobedience. One sin in the entire human race is appointed sinners. One sin in all mankind is sentenced to eternal death. By the one man Adam's one act of disobedience, we were all made sinners. Well, let's look at some application from all of this. Friends, Does it help you to understand when you look at your own life what God thinks of your sin? That even one of your sins is enough to condemn the entire human race? Tell a lie, bam, death to all. Think about this. Every human that has died has died because of that one sin. This is a very sobering thought. And here's the thing. God hates sin. He hates it. Any one sin Any sin brings his holy condemnation and judgment. If you are here and you are not a believer, first of all, I'm really glad you're here. But as you consider these things, is this news jarring? Is is God convicting you today of the sin in your life? Then I ask you to repent. Turn from your sin and believe in what Christ has done on your behalf. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And believer, let me talk to you for a minute. Do you understand the severity of sin in your life to a holy God? We are called to put to death the misdeeds of the body. So if you are a believer, repent of taking sin lightly and instead come to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Just as the effect of the one man, Adam, leads to inevitable results, condemnation, and death, so the effect of the one man, Jesus, leads to certain other inevitable results. So, point number two, the effect of the one man, Jesus. As we look at our text now, we're going to shift from the as statements in the two verses to the so statements. So look closely at our text in verse 18 again. As one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so... One act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. We have been going deep with the fact that what Adam did led to certain results for his people, for all of mankind. So now in the same way, what Christ has done leads to certain results for his people. Keep in mind that Paul is not talking about here what is known as universalism. That is, that all people will be saved. No. Rather, he is using the literary device that we talked about before, parallelism, to keep his analogy pure. So when he says, for all men here, he is meaning those who accept the gift of salvation in Christ alone. Look at the phrase, 
one act of righteousness. Look at the text. One act of righteousness. As a contrast to the one trespass of Adam, which brought condemnation and death, Christ's one act of righteousness brought justification and life. So see this. The effects of these two acts are opposite. They are exactly opposite. Again, the analogy is that the one act of one man has an effect on many. So Adam does a sinful act against God, while Christ acts only righteously and as of, of his heavenly Father. Another way to think about this would be to consider how one thing, if one thing came true in Adam because of his sin, death, then how much more will something else much greater come true in Christ? So let's dig a, deep, uh, a bit deeper into these truths. Uh, for a good, a good explanation of what is meant by one act of righteousness, let's hear from Paul in Romans 3.21. So turn back a page if you'd like to follow. Chapter 3, verse 21 and, 20, and the first part of 22. Romans 3.21 and 22 says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we see that God's righteousness appears in the person of Jesus Christ. It was what? Manifested. It was manifested as God the Son became man. J.I. Packer sums up well what this one act of righteousness is. He says, The gospel announces that the Son of God has become man and has died on the cross to save us from eternal judgment. The saving death of Christ, listen to this, quenched God's wrath against us by obliterating our sins from his sight. So all men deserve God's wrath because all men are condemned. However, think of it. Jesus Christ has shielded you from the just punishment that you deserve by becoming your representative substitute, by becoming righteousness for you and receiving the wages of your sin in your place. This is the righteousness that Paul speaks of in our text. But what does this righteousness lead to? Well, take a look. We have two things, justification and life. Justification is used here as a legal declaration. It is contrasted with condemnation that we looked at earlier, where To condemn is to declare someone guilty, where justification is the opposite. It is meaning to declare someone not guilty. It is God declaring you to be righteous in his sight. This means that those who have faith in Christ have no penalty to pay for sin, including past, present, and future sins. This truth shows up very clearly in the beginning of Romans chapter 8 as Paul declares this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. What good news this is. In addition, though, we see here to Christ's righteousness resulting in justification, it also leads to life. So look back at verse 17. So chapter 5, verse 17, just right there before our text today, it says this, For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Paul says here that because of Adam's trespass, death reigned. But what is it that Christ does? He says he frees those who are in him to reign in life. So Paul, he, Paul is, is, is laying out the starkest of contrasts. What you could not gain is now provided through Christ. Much more, in fact, it says. You are finished with the reign of death. You are now able to reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. He came to provide the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness to those he calls his own. So the analogy is clear. On the one hand is the one man, Adam's one trespass leading to condemnation, to death. And on the other, in a much greater way, is the one man, Christ's righteousness, freeing us from this same law of sin and death. We are declared righteous. Friend, are you searching for meaning or trying somehow to gain salvation by doing good things? I ask you this today. Oh, you may look good on the outside, but on the inside, are you dead, as we've read here? Think about it. Do you put your trust in your own works? I urge you to instead accept the free gift of righteousness in Christ alone this morning. 
But now, look at verse 19. Look at verse 19. Remember how I talked about the importance of the neon word for, which accentuates a, a thought begun in verse 18? Well, look at, look at verse 19. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. In this second half of the verse, take note of a most glorious, incredible truth. It contrasts with the former statement of fact about our sinful nature. Our text here says that the many will be made righteous. Paul is saying that as the first statement is undeniably true, then how much more is also the second one undeniably true? But this leads to a question. How can God declare us to be not guilty but righteous when in fact we are unrighteous? How does this work? Well, to help with this, I know I'm making you work this morning, but turn back with me to Genesis 15, okay? Genesis 15, verses 4 through 6. We're going to see or hear a conversation between Abram and God. All right? Genesis 15, verses 4 through 6. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. See here that the word of the Lord came to Abram. God promised Abram that he would provide him with a son who would be his heir. And then catch this. What does it say? That Abram believed the Lord and he, God, counted it to him as righteousness or credited it to him as righteousness. Was there anything inherently righteous in Abram? No. Shake your head no. Absolutely not. Okay? In fact, Abram had inherited the same sinful nature as all men before him and all men after him. So God chose to credit Abram with righteousness. This happened by the transfer or the imputation of God's righteousness to him by faith. It says he believed. Remember, imputation is a righteous judge making a legal declaration of innocence or guilt. So in this case, God declares people righteous who aren't righteous in and of themselves. But we have to ask, on what evidence will God declare someone righteous or just? Well, What Paul is saying in our text when he writes of being made righteous is that God appoints someone to be righteous on the basis of an external righteousness. That is that of his son, Jesus Christ, and in him alone. It is not because he looks at humanity and he sees anything uh, in us that is inherently righteous. No, this would contradict the truth of original sin that we saw earlier. Remember how in the Garden of Eden, after they sinned, Adam and Eve, it says they were naked so they, they, they were ashamed. Well, later on in, in, that, in that chapter, God does something for them. It says in Genesis 3, 21, that the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. The prophet Isaiah actually helps complete this picture when he says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. By God's own grace and mercy, he chose to clothe Adam and Eve in that garden. And he chose to clothe Abram in righteousness by the transfer or imputation of Christ's righteousness to him by faith. So friends, it's as if Christ is covering the shame of your nakedness and of all your sinful deeds with his robe of righteousness. As you are in Adam because of his sin, so you are in Christ because of his righteousness. Your sinful nature has been changed It has been changed because it says the many will be made righteous. What a glorious truth. So, let's move finally to this one word. There's one word that I I intentionally skipped over here. We haven't talked about. One word found in the middle of the last statement in our text back in Romans. And I I think this this word is a kind of mountaintop for these two verses. Look at the text with me. What is it that leads to the many being made righteous? It is Christ's obedience. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The one man's obedience here could be restated as one man's life of obedience. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it this way, the great truth is 
all we are and have comes out of the obedience of the second one. All the benefits of salvation come to us solely and entirely because of the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, once more, turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews. We're going to go towards the right side now of your, of your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. Let's take a look at this. As we start to look at what does this mean? What is Christ's obedience? Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and texts and, and tears, excuse me, to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. What is clear is that the writer of Hebrews speaks to several things here, one of which is the humanity of Jesus. Look at, look at this, this, these two verses, uh, three verses. It says, when he, sp- he speaks of the days of his flesh and of his cries and his tears. Christ had to put on flesh and dwell among us as a man in order to be our perfect representative, to obey in our place. As one commentator says, he was made perfect, as it talks about in here, in the sense that he became perfectly qualified in experience. He was perfectly qualified and experienced to be the source of eternal salvation to all believers. So this obedience was certainly on display as Christ lived through every second of every day of his 33 years here on earth. This was evidenced, for instance, when Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted and perfectly obeyed God's will, even in the midst of intense physical hunger and temptation from, from Satan. It says in our, in our verse here, it says what? He learned obedience through what he suffered. There are many other scripture passages that help us with a more full picture of Christ's obedience. And you don't need to turn to these, but listen as I go through a few. John 8, 28 to 29 says, So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. This text is clear. Jesus did nothing of his own authority, but always spoke what his father taught him. Think of it. Always obeying. Oh, that our kids would do that, right? Jesus did. Always. Always obeying. Always doing the things that were pleasing to his father. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see how this played out as Jesus was greatly distressed and troubled and that his soul was very sorrowful, even to death. He then cried out to the Father, saying, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And then there's Philippians 2.8, which shows us the pinnacle of his obedience. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. R.C. Sproul says that God requires that his law be fulfilled perfectly. And unless you possess perfect righteousness, you will never be justified. For Jesus to save us, not only did Jesus have to die for our penalty, he had to live for our righteousness. And so the perfect one, Christ Jesus our Lord, did what Adam could not do. He did what the people of Israel could not do, and he did what we cannot do. He was perfectly obedient. And because of his entire life of obedience that culminated with his act of obedience at the cross, Believer, this one man took your condemnation, this one man died in your place, and this one man was obedient to make you righteous. So what does this mean? What does this mean for us today? Well, we talked earlier about how the two verses of our text are a summary and a conclusion to what Paul has been saying in Romans 5. And in the same way, there is a beautiful conclusion that flows out of the truth of these two verses, and it is this. Assurance of salvation. Assurance of salvation. You know, it seems as if, as we look around, that the foundations of our society are crumbling everywhere. I think we all recognize it, and everywhere we look, we see people who are scared, people who are anxious, people who have no hope. And it seems like there are no rock-solid assurances of anything. But our text today offers an accurate portrayal of both our situation 
and also our only salvation. Think of this. The way to have assurance with anything is to understand the objective truth that underlies it. So you will sit in a chair if you understand or have faith in the objective truth that it'll hold you, right? Or you'll fly in an aircraft if you have and understand the objective truth that the pilot is well qualified. Well, the underlying truths we see in Scripture that we've been talking about speak of two men. First, we are all born in Adam. We know this because of the truth that everyone dies. It is a fact beyond all others. No one disputes the fact of death for all. And this means that even though we have done nothing at conception or at birth, we were legally declared a sinner, and thus we were under the condemnation unto death. A sinful nature has been imputed to us. However, consider also the accompanying underlying truth of the one man, Jesus. Our text today helps us see the results of a glorious comparison. As we consider ourselves uh, ourselves by faith in Christ, we see that we also have done nothing to make ourselves righteous. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone that we are saved, that we are declared righteous. Death's power can therefore be broken because Christ overcame it. 2 Timothy 1 says, Christ abolished death. But think of this. The opposite is not true. Adam and his sin and death cannot abolish or overcome that which Christ has already accomplished. Only Adam's act is overcome. Christ's cannot be overcome. So the effect of Adam's disobedience can be canceled. It was canceled. But the effect of Christ's obedience is forever. Our salvation is legally binding because his work has brought us justification. And justification by faith leads to an inevitable result, and that is absolute certainty. Believer, if you have received from God his gift of grace through Jesus Christ, how long are you going to have it? Forever. And there isn't one act by any one man who can change that. Think of it. We were in Adam We who were in Adam are now in Christ. All things have become new. We cannot go back to being in Adam. This is the underlying truth we trust. This is the effect of our salvation in Christ, assurance. So by the one man's sin, all of humanity died, but in a much, much greater way, God's free gift of righteousness offered in Christ has won for us eternal life. Brothers and sisters, do you struggle with the fact of your salvation, with assurance, If so, won't you accept the truth of your right standing in him? We who are in Christ have the assurance that we have been set free from sin. We have been declared righteous. This is the gospel, and it is good news. And non-believer, I ask you, I ask you today, will you accept the free gift of righteousness offered in Christ Jesus? Will you come to him for your salvation? If you have questions about this, what this means, I would encourage you to talk to one of our elders this morning uh, or come and talk to me or someone that's sitting next to you. Come to Christ. Well, this morning we have looked at the effects of the one man Adam versus the one man Jesus Christ. And what is our conclusion? Our standing before God has completely changed because of the effect of Christ. Our nature has been completely changed because of the effect of Christ. And our salvation depends only and entirely upon the obedience of Christ, the obedience of one. As we finish today, there's a wonderful song that we've been singing, and we're going to sing it here in a minute. It's titled, I Will Glory in My Redeemer. Listen to the first verse. I will glory in my Redeemer, whose priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on the judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death, my only Savior before the Holy Judge, the Lamb who is my righteousness. The Lamb who is my righteousness. Friends, Christ is our Redeemer who offers forgiveness and new life. His perfect act of obedience unto death and his defeating of death has won our righteousness. The effect of his life on all those who come to him in faith is eternal life. And for this, we glory in him and in him alone. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bow with humility this morning before you because of what you have done for us. 
as we inherited a sinful nature from the one man, Adam, we faced that which we could not defeat. And Father, because of what you did in the one man, Jesus Christ, your son, we now have access to you. We are now able to be declared righteous. And so, Father, we just glory in you this morning. We glory in you and in your Son and in your Holy Spirit, the unity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit by which we live, by which we have assurance of salvation this morning. Father God, thank you so much for what you have done for us. We praise you for your holy word. We praise you for the change that you are doing in our lives this morning. We pray that as we go from this place that you will use this time that we've had to impact the world for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Kevin. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he ate the Passover dinner with his disciples, and as they were eating, he gave them a picture of what the gospel is and what it accomplishes, which we have just heard this morning. What he did at that supper was to take bread and wine. He broke the bread and passed around the wine as a meal for his disciples and said that they should eat it and see it as his body and blood symbols of his death. So we come this morning to this meal today to proclaim just that, his death. And by his death, we now have peace towards each other, but most of all towards him. It is a symbol not only of his body and blood, but also of what that body broken and that blood poured out accomplished on our behalf. This is a declaration of the substitutionary death of Christ on behalf of his people and should be a real experience of the communion that is only found in Christ for his people. We as Christians are marked by repentance from our sin, our turning away from rebellion towards God and finding forgiveness because Christ has paid our debt through his death on the cross. If you are here this morning and are harboring sin, if you do not have the fellowship with Christ that comes through repentance and faith, uh, I urge you as we come to the table not to partake. Uh, consider the warning, warnings in 1 Corinthians 11 and examine yourself and your posture towards God. See this as a time that we invite you and, and be invited by Christ uh, to be reconciled to him. Hear the words of 1 John 1, 8 and 9. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Every one of us has sinned, right? But as Kevin just reminded us very clearly, uh, this verse goes on. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Consider the body of believers that enjoy the sweet fellowship around this table. We were once enemies towards God and each other, but have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so we partake in a meal together as a family of those redeemed. For those of you who practice regular repentance and enjoy the light of Christ, uh, you are invited to come uh, fellowship with one another. I invite you after I pray here in just a little bit. Uh, there are tables around the room that you may get uh, the glass and the, the bread. They're stacked together. If you will take them back to your seat, hold on to them. And then once all have been seated again, we'll partake together. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this reminder uh, that we have heard this morning uh, that Christ has accomplished for us what we cannot. That he has bought for us our redemption. He has paid for us the fine that we had because of our sin. Father, as we celebrate this meal, may we be reminded of that great truth 
May we be reminded of him. And Father, may we use this time to be uh, refreshed and to proclaim him uh, to whom we owe all things. In Christ's name, amen. First Corinthians eleven twenty three, Paul tells the church that on the night before he was crucified, Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, let us eat the bread in remembrance of our Lord. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink this cup as a memorial of his blood poured out for us. Father, thank you for these reminders. And this symbol, something that is tangible for us, that we might partake together as those drawn together in peace through the blood of Christ unto you. Father, bless us as we go. May we proclaim Christ with our words this week. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Amen. We have great hope in that, don't we? Let us uh, go out with this scripture, which says from First uh, Second Corinthians one, rather, "Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ." We are a people of grace and a people of peace. So let us go live that way in the world, making disciples of all the people around us. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>